Hey everybody, welcome back to the Director's Garage. Hello. I am your host and resident idiot Michael, and today folks, we're finally doing it. We're getting a full review of the Zale HM1. Or do you say Zal? See, the Chicago in me wants to say Zal, but I know it's Zale from interviews, so I don't know, whatever. Get an easier name to pronounce. Hey! <laughs> Typical American response, I think. Hell yeah, brother! Zay. Now, before we get into specifics, and this is going to be a long review, can I ask you guys to subscribe? Well, let's do it musically. I'm in the mood. Yeah, if, if you guys were annoyed by the sound effects, yeah. <laughs> this show is going to get really ridiculous from here. Uh, so this is an amp I purchased nearly a year in advance. It's in super high demand and relatively low supply. There are a few just trickling onto the used market now. Only 25 of these things make it to the U.S. each year and another 25 to the rest of the planet. So you start right there, right? And, and then what you get for your patience is one of the cleanest experiences in an amp I've ever heard to date. Everything sounds pure, unwashed, transparent. And, and this is without the EQ strip engaged. We'll talk about that in a bit, but then you start tweaking and this thing delivers a lot of thrills. It's a premium sounding amp and it should be at this price. Oh, did I mention it's eight grand? Check out the ergonomics, nothing to do with economics. I told you this was going to get silly. Okay, ergonomics, uh, brilliant generally. I, I prefer larger knobs on my gear. I like the feel of a bigger knob, but these feel like the kind of knobs I'd find on a precision piece of analog mixing gear. They are etched with a diamond pattern. It's a premium feel, and the resistance of the knobs is pleasing. The knobs that click do so with authority. You have no doubt where the setting is at any given moment. Toggle switches satisfy snap between positions. There's nothing that wiggles or jiggles. They're not too hard to flip, not too soft either. This is a top grade piece of kit. Now it's best to think of the layout of the HM1 as two separate rows. The top row is all signal routing. You can send the output of the HM1 to the headphones only or the pre-outs or both, which means the entire device can act as a straight headphone amp or a preamp out to another amp. Very clever. Now, on another toggle, you can engage either Class A or Class A servo with a feedback loop engaging error correction. When you flip it, the sound cuts out. That's good thinking. And both modes deliver a different experience. I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. Then you get to the input pots. You can select between two of them, and you have the ability to mix between them or cut hard between the sources. I, I thought it would be a really cool feature to have, but honestly, I've never used it. I I'm not often swapping between, say, two DACs. For my purposes, I'd rather have two sets of headphone outputs to jump quickly between headphones I'm auditioning. Below the input toggles is a bypass button. Now these remove the second row of knobs from the signal chain, which is where all the signal processing happens. <laughs> The processing strip has four adjustments. You have balance, a bass shelf, a treble shelf, and stereo separation. We'll dig into those shortly. Uh, around the back, there are a couple of odd things. First are the inputs. You must select between balanced or unbalanced for each channel. You can't feed both at once. You also have the option to add 15 dBs of gain at the flip of a switch on the back. I'm going to talk about gain staging later in this episode, but this is a switch you just don't want to mess with. <laughs> you also have an unbalanced loop through of the A input only. I think that's a bit curious. Why not unbalanced? And why is it only the A source? And one last note on the Argos, there is not a remote with this thing, and it would have been nice to have one. It's about power. Director's Garage. Power. Well,
well, I won't beat around the bush. This thing has a power deficit. It is nowhere near as powerful as both my Bakun or the Enlium we had on loan here from Audio 46 or even my Wu Audio WA5LE. If it weren't for the selectable power output from my DAC, I'd have been screwed on the Sisfar and the Tungsten. Seriously out of luck. Now, it can drive everything else comfortably on a 2-volt source signal, and for 99% of the headphones out there, that's plenty. Now, the good news is that the HM1 can take a lot of voltage on that input side, so that tougher-to-drive headphones can be sent, say, 9 or 10 volts without any clipping. And that makes the internal amp quite useful. But this thing is $8,000, and if I had a wish, it would be for a few more horses under the hood. It's about power. And while we're on the subject of power, a lot of folks only associate power with the amount of volume or loudness at the headphone. And certainly, that's job number one of any amp. But in my experience, that's just the start of the equation. It, it's the difference between driving a headphone, which is making that loudness, and driving the headphone well. So what does that look like? Well, one of the factors is power reserve. And this came into focus when I was reviewing the Enlium 23R. It's the amount of power on reserve or stored energy in the capacitors inside. And what happens when the circuit suddenly needs more power because of say a timpani hit or a loud sudden burst of loudness, you know, in the song. Well, the Enlium seem to have endless reserves to react to huge dynamic changes. And the Zale, while it's not quite as impressive as the Enlium, I, I never feel like this thing's on the edge. And to my ears, this amp can handle anything and deliver speed and even slam to most of my headphones. It's just not quite as flashy as the Enlium in the slam department, particularly on the Sisfara. That's not necessarily a bad thing. This is a cleaner, more polished presentation than the Enlium, which is a bit more raucous and fun. The Zale has an overall power deficit. The Mothouse Tungsten struggles a little on this amp. I've really got to open up the volume pot to like 75% with the DAC set to 6 volts output to produce a loud signal on the headphone. Now another way to tackle the Tungsten you like that? <laughs> okay, well, another way to do it would be to turn the output of the DAC down to 0.2 volts and then engage that 15 dB gain on the back of the amp. But when you do that, you're really introducing a lot of noise. It's nasty. Now, I don't know where they came up with 15 dB a gain as an idea. I'm guessing that maybe they thought they could preamp a phono cartridge with it? I'm not sure, but introducing that much gain is never a good idea. We also need to address the Class A and the Class A servo modes. <laughs> well, the, the servo option adds a negative feedback circuit to provide error correction, while the Class A setting just turns that circuit off. Uh, here's where I'm going to introduce the word that best describes the HM1, and this is going to be all over this review. The word is subtle. Like almost everything else on this amp, the change between Class A servo and Class A are subtle, but they're real. Class A mode is a bit livelier. It's a little messy. It adds a little bit of grit or texture, maybe heft to the sound. I found myself using Class A on hip hop, hard rock, metal, new wave, punk, or anything with a little bit of drive. And I found myself using servo mode for jazz, classical, easy listening, alt and prog rock, anything with nuance and cleanliness to the sound. It's a little bit of a romantic mode. The servo mode is a bit cleaner to my ears. These modes are more music specific though than headphone specific to my way of thinking. The changes are slight changes. They're not crazy different. Again, the keyword here is subtle. Every switch, other than the gain on the back and the balance control and arguably the power control on the front, every adjustment on this amp introduces subtle changes, not wholesale earth shattering differences. Class A versus Class A servo is like a little bit of seasoning one way or another. 
Let's talk about the bass and treble knobs. Now these are more like tone controls, really. They're just adding or subtracting a little bit of a bass or treble shelf. They do not do targeted frequency boosts or cuts. These are really wide shelves at either end of the audio spectrum. You're either cutting or boosting by just a dB or two. The results again are very subtle, but very real. I generally have found myself leaving the treble control kind of in unity and that neutral position. The bass, I might push it up a notch or two. I'm a bass fan. A little booty nudge isn't a bad thing. Mm. Giving my planers just a slight kick in the ass, it's kind of nice. And the last knob on that bottom row is the stereo separation knob. And it produces some fairly impressive options when you engage it. It's not pure crossfeed, but it's kind of a crossfeed light effect. Uh, the knobs, again, the key to all of this is nuance. I keep using the word subtle. I know I'm a broken record, but it's really true. It just adds a little bit of width on either side. Even at its max, it's nowhere near what Sony's portable players were doing in the 1990s. Remember that X-Feed thing? It was nuts. <laughs> It's nothing gives you that kind of crazy jump on any of these controls. These are sweetening tools, not really sound shaping tools. And when you consider that Zale has been mostly known for mixers, all of these adjustments are more like what you would find in a typical channel strip adjustment on a mixer. Slight changes as opposed to sending your signal out to a parametric EQ where you can tweak every aspect of the signal to your heart's content or send it to a spatial enhancer where you could really give yourself an environment. The Zale has introduced me to a concept I'd never really bothered to understand before, and that's gain staging. The Zale is a class A amp, and that means that the amp is always working at maximum output. The volume pot is a straight rheostat, or a valve that lets more or less voltage make its way from the inside of the amp out to the headphone. But what you want to avoid is an input signal that's too low in amplitude. Because in this quietest part of the signal is where the noise lives. And if you make the amp rev up a quiet signal, it's pushing the noise in the same amount that it's pushing the music. The greater the distance between the peak output of the signal and the noise floor, the less the amp will be boosting the noise, along with the part of the signal you want to hear, which is the music. So let's talk about this in real world terms. What do I do with the Sisfara when it's not giving me enough volume? Well, what I do is I jump the output of the DAC from two volt output up to six volt output. And that feeds the Zale with enough power so that it can use its three volts, three and a half volts of internal amplification. And it gives me enough power to drive the Sisfara. Now, even though I feel that the Zale is struggling on internal power and I'm compensating for it with the output of the DAC, the good news here is that the internals of the Zale are really quiet. This thing delivers an incredibly low total harmonic distortion, and that's the amount of self-generated noise the amp itself is introducing to the signal. And that means whatever I'm boosting in the amp is staying very, very clean, and that's the real genius of this amp is that you can keep pushing more voltage on the input side and you're never going to get to a situation where there's noticeable noise on the output signal. This thing stays crazy clean. And that's where I think the Zale sort of compensates for any lack of power internally. Gotta talk about some headphones. Yeah, baby. Headphones. Okay, we got to talk about some headphones and some headphone pairings. Y'all know I'm gonna talk about the Sisvara. <laughs> Y'all know I struggle with the Sisvara. And coming off that recent Enlium review, I will tell you point blank, the Sisvara with the HM1 pairing is a step below that of the Sisvara and the Enlium. But I gotta admit, the mid and treble performance out of the HM1 is perfection. It's even better than the Enlium. There is no sacrifice in bass quantity either. And in fact, the bass is more detailed than on the Enlium amp. Actually, there's more detail everywhere through the HM1. 
But what the Enlium does that the HM1 does not is base slam. The Enlium has that power reserve I talked about earlier that can be tapped at any time it wants to push the far into slam on the low end. And I will tell you that if you're looking for the best amp to drive the Sisfara, to me, the Enlium stands alone at the top. Although I have to confess, I haven't heard the Kobo or the Riviera, any of these amps that are drawing raves from Sisfara owners. Still, the Sisfara is fantastic with the HM1, even if it doesn't slap and slam you around. On pure technicals, the Zale HM1 is a better amp. For evaluating gear, the Zale is a better choice. But for everyday Sisfara listening, it's going to be the Enlium for me. There's a synergy and a deliciousness with the Enlium, with that prodigious bass slam that sends the Sisfara into orbit. Headphones, uh... All right, we got to talk about the Caldera, and the HM1, in my opinion, is one of the very best Caldera amps, in my opinion. I, I think it's top tier to be sure. I didn't find that I enjoyed any other pairing as much as I did the Zale with the Caldera. It just drives this thing to perfection. You've got outstanding clarity, you've got outstanding detail, ample bass, a lush, rich experience. Macy Gray's Stripped album gets a massive and impressive soundstage on the Caldera. Tremendous experience. It's a total win. The Abyss 1266 TC. The HM1 is a great pairing for the Abyss flagship. My favorite pairing, I think, for this headphone is still the Ferrum Or, and I also love the Wu WA5LE, but the HM1 is maybe just a tick below those two other experiences. Now, other headphones that really worked well with the Zale, the ZMF Atrium, the Meze Elite, the LCD4, the Zale is a winner with most of the easier to drive headphones I own. <music> Lastly, let's talk about the Mod House, the dual sided tungsten. Well, it's barely passable on this amp, being honest. It sounds good, but I get the feeling that this combo is out of the Zale's sweet spot. The volume is at nearly 75% with a 6-volt input to get loud. It delivers music cleanly, but I much preferred the Mod House on my Wu WA5LE. The tube seemed to give the tungsten more body. It's my favorite tungsten pairing. Now, one last thing I tried, and this was a viewer recommendation, I used the Zale as a preamp for the WA5LE. This was an interesting proposition because I get the benefit of those EQ tweaks and the stereo imaging and the little stuff, but I also get the warmth of a tube amp sound. And I did think that the Zale warmed up the signal compared to directly out of the Lena DAC, but I also sensed that I was losing a little bit of detail in there too. Still, it's a different way to approach the WA5LE and a worthy experiment. I'm going to have to play with this a little bit more to decide if it's my permanent go-to, but for now I'm going to keep the Zale out of the signal chain, at least for now. Conclusion, conclusion. All right, let's start bringing this crazy long episode home. Uh, do you need this amp? No. No one, no one needs an $8,000 amp. Certainly not one that doesn't punch with headphone amps that cost thousands of dollars less. The difference to me that sets this amp apart is how clean it sounds. That's the X factor of the Zale. It gets the cleanliness of the signal and the onboard sweetening. Everything about the Zale is subtle and elegant. It's delicate. Every adjustment presents minor changes, like adding spice to a recipe, just a hint, a brush more bass, a sprinkling of treble, a dash of expansion to the sound stage. Uh, while this amp isn't going to knock your socks off in the power delivery, it's the subtlety of the power delivery and the cleanliness of the power and the stage that makes this amp rewarding, even if it is insanely priced. Can you get better price for performance? <laughs> Absolutely. The hollow amps, the Ferrum, the Burson, you get most of the way to the Zale for about $3,000, which means you're paying $5,000 for a little cleaner signal and the ability to add a touch of grittiness or a 
dash of treble or bass boost or a little bit of a sound stage tweak. It's not worth the extra money in my opinion, but if you want these attributes, the price tag is $5,000 more than a comparable amp. I have a like-love relationship with this amp. I love the sound of this amp. I love the tone controls and the stereo effect. It's a great looking and sounding amp, especially for easier to drive headphones. I, I like the Class A and the Class A servo modes. It's a great product. It has good output with the right gain staging, but as I noted, this amp could use more power for the more demanding headphones. You see, it's eight grand, people. It's eight grand. And part of me thinks this thing should drive any headphone in existence to perfection for that price, in my opinion, without the need to stage your gain. For this price, there should be a high power mode built in to give you eight watts out of this thing when you need the horses. And I gladly give up the extra input to make room for that extra power. As for the Sisfara, I just think I shouldn't have Enlium Envy on an amp that costs this much, even though it's better built and better sounding overall. Will it stay? Or will it go? The question left in my head is, does the Zale outperform the Lena amp? I don't have an answer for that. I would need to get that amp in here for a direct comparison. And I won't be selling the Zale, at least for now. It's delivering remarkable music and given me many nights of enjoyment for nearly six months. It's my go-to and my daily driver. Well, that's not bad when you think about it, right? Even more so with the Lena clock and the DAC in the stack. Now, with unlimited funds, I'd get all the amps in here and do one mega, mega shootout, but the director's garage doesn't have unlimited funds. Maybe someone will take pity on our little show and lend us a Lena amp for review. But until then... Now, people ask me all the time, should I buy this amp or that amp? Is this amp the best? Blah, blah, blah. And my answer is this. Most amps are more alike than dissimilar because all amps operate under the same basic principles. Some are less noisy, some are more powerful, some isolate things better. But a headphone will change the sound of your rig far more than any two different amps will. Good amps do their thing and try to do it cleanly. Try not to influence the sound chain much and let your headphone be the star. Well, the Zale HM1 does that, but so do a lot of other amps for a lot less money. So I don't think I recommend buying this amp because of its price and its scarcity. Though I certainly bought it myself, it's truly a great product other than the price. And there's a lot of greatness inside this thinned case. But going back to where I started, no one really needs an $8,000 amp. Yo boy, what's on the show mix? Okay, so that's my exhaustive, and I mean exhaustive, review of the Zale HM1. I hope it was worth the wait. We have more on the way from ZMF and a full review of the gorgeous sounding Dan Clark Audio E3. I can't wait to dig in, so you gotta make sure you... Well, I gotta do this again. Like, like, and subscribe. I swear, guys, I'm in nerd heaven right now. <laughs> okay, give this episode a thumbs up if you enjoyed my review of the Zale HM1. We can do the other thing because, well, the reasons are growing, aren't they? <laughs> I can't say I blame you either way. And I will see you before you know it. Your resident idiot.